This is the man, the sportsman whose career took him to the top of the field. He began playing hockey as a boy in much the same way as his son Andre is doing today. This is the man who brought a new fervor and a new zeal to the game. This is the man who, even in his younger years, was displaying that tireless determination that was to lead him to eminence as the hero of an entire generation. Maurice Richard, born on the 4th of August, 1921, in a gray stone house in the St. Denis Street area of Montreal, was the first child of Onisim and Alice Richard. He was 10 years old at the start of the Great Depression, and his future, like that of all the other young Canadians of his age, hinged on one hope, a fresh upsurge in business. The economy of the country, however, continued to be sluggish, and even after some years in technical school, the road to economic security seemed blocked with uncertainty. Maurice Richard owes much of his first success to a man named Georges Norchet. It was Norchet who was his first hockey coach and who introduced him to his sister Lucille, the girl Richard was to court and finally marry. After that, Paul Stuart recommended the young player to a scout of the Maple Leafs of Verdun. After being helped along this far, his career now depended upon himself and an unwavering courage which kept him in good stead for 18 years, a period in which he chalked up as many injuries as hockey records. In October 1942, a short time after his wedding, Tommy Gorman got him to sign a contract with Le Canadien of the National Hockey League. But in December, he fractured an ankle and team officials let it be known they were not overly hopeful about a player who was injured so often. The following season, however, he became the fourth player in team history to count up 30 goals in regular games. From that time on, all eyes focused on him. Then, in the spring of 1944, there was a state of delirious excitement among his supporters. The reason? Les Canadiens won their first Stanley Cup in 13 years. Richard was now driven by one ambition. His success had to last. And from their seats, spectators watched this dynamic player with awe. In 1949, he had already gathered more goals than Bill Cook and had surpassed the total of a retired Toe Blake. But his was not to be a career devoid of blows and bruises. Every goal that he rung up carried with it a firm personal determination. Every setback carried the threat that an explosion-prone nature would reach the boiling point. And this was the McLean incident, and the first quarrels with the president of the league, Clarence Campbell. The desire to reach the top was a hot, burning fire inside of him, and he had to prove his worth. But then even the smallest injustice handed down by a referee was a matter of major proportion. Someday there might be a feeling of calm, but this was not the time. This was the time for action, for that well-timed, precise action that would send the goalie scurrying for the puck in vain. Richard scored with such regularity, of course, that the team made an enviable showing. By 1951, he had equaled the record of Howie Morenz, the only player with whom he has been compared. He had also equaled that of Aurel Joliet. But Richard had set himself another objective, to top the record of Nell Stewart, a 324-goal man who held first place in the National Hockey League. Playing against Toronto on the 29th of October, 1952, he outplayed Harry Lumley to equal the record. One more goal would set a new record, and it should have been a relatively simple matter. But Richard was over-anxious, and it took him 10 days to make it. Added to his anxiety was the fact that he had to fight his way out of a variety of checkmate situations that closed in on him every time he got on the ice. Playing in his 517th game, he foiled Al Rollins of the Chicago Blackhawks at the Forum before a crowd which rose in riotous ovation. That night, Richard not only succeeded in joining the historical greats of Canadian hockey, 
but he also reached the high point of his career.